Long-lived assets usually have a finite useful life. At purchase, the value of the asset is capitalized as a non-current asset on the balance sheet at cost. To account for decreasing asset value over time, tangible assets are depreciated, while intangible assets are amortized at a fixed schedule over the useful life of the asset. That is, the carrying value on the balance sheets gets reduced over time. For example, if the asset's purchase price was $10,000, these could be the scheduled carrying values of the asset for the next four years. For some intangible assets, such as goodwill, they don't have a finite life, so their value is assumed to be constant throughout, that is, there is no amortization schedule. For intangibles with indefinite lives, they are to be tested annually for impairment. Impairment exists when the carrying amount exceeds its fair value. That's all you need to know about goodwill impairment, which will be further elaborated in Level 2. For assets with finite lives, there are circumstances where the value of a long-lived asset can fall below its expected fair value, so the carrying value on the balance sheet may not be an accurate reflection of the asset's market value. This may be due to obsolescence as a result of technological advancements, and or a decline in market price. While accounting standards do not require a test for asset value impairment at the end of each period, the company is required to regularly assess whether there are indications of impairments. If there is possibility of impairment, an impairment test should be conducted. Under IFRS, an asset is impaired if its carrying value that is, its historical cost less accumulated depreciation, exceeds the recoverable amount. The recoverable amount is the greater of its fair value less any selling costs and its value in use. The value in use is the present value of its future cash flow stream from continued use and disposal. Value in use is a highly subjective figure, requiring estimation of future cash flows, disposal proceeds, and the selection of an appropriate discount rate. If impaired, the asset's carrying value must be written down on the balance sheet to the recoverable amount. Under US GAAP, there are two steps. First, to test for impairment and to recognize the loss. The test is known as the recoverability test, which is to determine if the carrying value is greater than the sum of the asset's undiscounted future cash flows. If that is so, we write down the carrying value to the asset's fair value. So, for example, let's say the fair value of the asset has fallen to $6,000, but the value in use is estimated at $6,500. Under IFRS, the asset has to be impaired to its recoverable amount of $6,500, which means the impairment loss is $1,500. Under US GAAP, if the recoverability test is passed, the asset must be impaired to its fair value of $6,000. The impairment loss is therefore $2,000 in this case. For both IFRS and US GAAP, the impairment loss is recognized in the income statement, so this reduces net income. Like depreciation and amortization expenses, the impairment loss is a non cash item so it does not affect the company's cash flows. So let's say at the next reporting date, there is a severe shortage of the asset in the market, so its value shoots up. Again, the carrying value on the balance sheet does not reflect the value of the asset. What can be done in this case? Under IFRS, an impairment loss on an identifiable long-lived asset can be reversed if the asset's value recovers in the future. However, the loss reversal is limited to the original impairment loss, so the maximum amount that can be reversed is $1,500 in this case. Reversal of past write-downs is not permitted under US GAAP. Sometimes, a company may choose to sell a long-lived asset before the end of its useful life. When an asset is marked for sale, it is reclassified to held for sale non-current asset 
and the depreciation or amortization schedule ceases. The asset is tested for impairment, which is the same for both standards. If the carrying value exceeds the fair value less selling costs, the asset is written down to this value and the loss recognized in the income statement. In the event that carrying value is lower, both IFRS and US GAAP allow for the reversal of past impairment losses. In essence, remember that US GAAP allows for reversal for held for sale assets, but not held for use assets. IFRS allows reversal for both types. Eventually, a company will have to remove long lived assets from its balance sheet, either when it is sold, disposed, or deemed to be worthless. When a long lived asset is sold, the difference between the sale proceeds and the carrying value of the asset is reported as a gain or loss in the income statement under the Other Gains and Losses section. The carrying value of the asset is removed from the balance sheet replaced by the cash proceeds from the sale. More details on the sale may be documented in the footnotes or MD&A section. Also, if the firm presents its cash flow statement using the indirect method, the gain or loss is removed from net income to compute the CFO. This is because the proceeds from selling a long-lived asset are an investing cash inflow, not operating cash flow. If a long-lived asset cannot be sold and is abandoned, the treatment is similar to a sale, except there are no proceeds, so there is a total loss of the carrying value, which is removed from the balance sheet and a loss of that amount is recognized in the income statement. If a long-lived asset is exchanged for another asset, a gain or loss is computed by comparing the carrying value of the old asset with the fair value of the new asset. The carrying value of the old asset is removed from the balance sheet and the new asset is recorded at its fair value. Likewise, the gain or loss is recorded in the income statement. Sometimes a firm may choose to spin off an entire division or subsidiary into a new legal entity, which will distribute new shares to the firm's existing shareholders. Once a spin-off becomes probable, all the assets under the division should be reclassified as held-for-sale assets. In this context, it can also be termed held-for-distribution. After the completion of the spin-off, these are considered disposed and removed from the balance sheet. No profit or loss is recorded in the income statement. You're watching an excerpt from our comprehensive animation library. For more videos like these, head on down to prepnuggets.com. At Prep Nuggets, let us do the hard work for you.